All right, the meeting is being recorded, so I'm going to mute. Okay, it's Friday, May 24th. This is the Chaos Value Metrics Group weekly call. Um, on our agenda, we have um, introductions. We've got some new people. We've uh, got a proposal to submit for ChaosCon. Let's talk about what it should contain. We want to hear about Augur, and uh, we want to hear about Vinod's uh, value survey. And we want to talk a little bit about grants, and I am setting up some interviews. So let's get started with introductions. Um, Parth, nice to see your face. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you and what your involvement is going to be with our project. Uh, Parth may not be able to answer that question clearly yet, but you go for it, Parth. <laughs> uh, my name's Parth, and I'll be working on implementing metrics. Uh, on Augur. That's exactly okay. right. And uh, Parth has contributed to Augur before. Yeah, I've implemented a few evolution metrics before. Mm -hmm. to the GitHub API, and I plan on implementing more APIs through the summer, mostly risk and value metrics. Awesome. Sean, could you, could you maybe just give a little bit more of a of an overview of the Augur team. How many people, what types of experience, what types of things are they going to be working on? Sure. Parth is um, uh, one of our two Google Summer Code students. Uh, he's a student uh, undergraduate in um, his local university near New Delhi, and he will be working on implementing risk and value metrics. The, the other intern or the other Google Summer Code student will be doing the same. I also have Gabe Heim, who is our uh, one of our more experienced people with Augur. He's working full-time on the project this summer. And I also have a new person, Alita Nelson, who will be working on the project full-time this summer. Um, a gentleman named Paul Orton, who is who is working with us this week. And uh, this weekend is going to Ireland for a month of study. So he may contribute some. He actually got quite a lot done this last week um, implementing our new architecture. Um, and I will explain that in a second. And then we have um, part-time contributors this summer are mostly Carter Landis, who has got another internship, but he will be around. And then of course, Derek Howard will continue some level of engagement with the project. So as far as where Augur is headed, we have designed and have now implemented what we're calling a, or what is a worker broker kind of architecture for getting data. And we're putting all that data now in a and basically what that allows us to do is schedule the collection of data for all the repositories and decide if we want to get GitHub data, we can just turn that on for a repository. If we want just to get data, we can have that on. Um, as part of that, we've moved everything into a consolidated Postgres uh, database schema, um, principally for performance reasons. Um, and <clears throat> I can... I have a few questions for you, Sean. You go. Is the schema, is it done? I think it's pretty close. Yeah, let okay. me show, I'm just going to bring it up. So okay. I, can, I know I created a PDF the other day, but maybe I put it in the archive area. I think this is a huge thing for Augur, to be yeah. honest with you. So for the longest time, the I think there were multiple schemas that were feeding Augur. And I think yep. Sean and Sean, you and your team have spent a ton of time <laughs> trying to basically smush the disparate schemas together. Right, yeah, and we've done, we've a mission accomplished. And I'm just gonna share something here really quick. This will be really small at the start, but I will do. This is going to support me a lot in my research work. <laughs> okay, so all right, I made that smaller. That didn't really do what I wanted it to do. Hold on a second. Now I have to zoom in. No, 8% is good. <laughs> okay, well, this is gonna be a little too small. Oh, no, that's good. You could even just pick a section. So the main, the main um, table or the main structure for, of the data is, let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, so you'll see a repository called repo. Yep. That's for GitHub repositories um, or any Git repository. Um, we have repo groups, which are collections of Git repositories that we want to look at together. So for example, I've collected Comcast and Netflix and 
I have to go look at the list. There were five Apaches, um, GitHub projects, uh, the ones we talked about, Andy. I don't have the list right in front of me. Yeah. Actually, I could have the list right in front of me if I open another file. Um, so is group, groups is a user-defined grouping? It's not like organization? Um, no, it's user-defined. So okay. um, you can, in theory, we could define multiple groupings of the same repositories, but I'm kind of not wanting to support that. So okay. Um, well, obviously, okay, yeah, in one repo can live in multiple groups. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's see, where is that? Um, what are you looking for? I was just looking for the list of repos, but um, projects. Uh, I maybe didn't commit that yesterday from my other computer. Anyhow. Um, I've got the repos collected. I'm behind on implementing the value repos because this week we um, got on a roll and we've fully converted Facade, which is our data collection repository mining tool, into a Postgres database program. So we had to do a bunch of stuff to refactor Facade, but we did that. Um, I've got it working on the straight up Facade uh, schema and we have parts of the facade schema implemented here so that now what Gabe is doing is just moving over the, and we've got some additional fields. So like the biggest, the biggest um, table for facade is commits. And some of the fields are more commonly named now, but Gabe is gonna do the mapping, is doing the mapping right now to bring it straight into the auger, auger schema. So we'll have all the things that presently live in a separate MySQL schema inside of this schema. Um, as of probably the end of today. And so, so mapping, mapping like names or yeah, column or, names basically. Okay. Yeah. So and there's may not exist in one. Right. Okay. Right. So, and we have some relationships here that are enforced that are not enforced on the GH torrent schema or the facade schema presently. So Okay. In the interest of some data integrity, we're putting foreign keys on things, so you can't populate a bunch of issues unless you have users, um, which is the contributors table, things like that, which okay. make perfect sense. Here's contributors down here. All this makes perfect sense if you think about it, but it's not the way that it works right now. And we've implemented, as of the end of this week, our first two workers, which are the data collection mechanisms. The first one, I talked with Matt Snell about this yesterday, is pulling all of the badging information from the Linux Foundation's badging site yep. into a table. So that's working um, right now. Great. And then the other one is getting, the other one's getting GitHub issues and GitHub comments, and also populating GitHub users as contributors. So um, that was actually my other question, is how do I invoke those workers? Um, when, once we release it, so this is, I say it's working, it's working in a development branch, it's not released yet, but when it's released, uh, there'll be instructions for that. The, the okay. short of it is that we're gonna strive to have it be as automatic as possible. Okay, is there a UI? Is there gonna be some sort of user interface that will allow me to schedule the workers or to turn them on, turn them off? Yeah, there'll be some kind of administration for that. Okay. Um, I don't have that implemented yet, so it's probably gonna start with a readme uh -huh. um, because I have a file, I have a, a program that we're going to incorporate into Augur that if you give me a GitHub organization, it goes and collects all the repositories okay. and, and does the facade piece. So I'm going to include that as part of the facade worker once once we finish converting the facade worker into the Augur schema. Is so, the worker going to be part of the database or is it going to be its own like Python thing? So the, the worker is its own Python thing. Okay. So And its focus is on data collection. Okay. And by having this architecture, we make it a lot easier for people to say, I want to collect information about these four GitHub organizations and deploy um, my Augur schema. Okay. And it's done. The other thing that we're going to do um, for backward compatibility, uh, at least for now, is allow, we're going to leave our current GH torrent APIs open and um, have a, we'll have a public GH torrent instance that will let people who are running Augur hit so if so you don't have to if you don't want to create your own instance of GH torrent, which is kind cool. of an undertaking. What is the what is the worker what can it do? It can go so, get, yeah. so I yeah, I specify the repositories that I'm gonna collect. And then if I have, for example, the issue worker 
and the Linux Foundation badging program worker, which are the, and the facade worker, I'll have all of the repo data that's currently, you know, basically the workers will automatically go in and create a, um, uh, the, so that the way it works, I can, I can draw this visually and I actually have a, a Google doc. If, if you want to go this deep, I can get it, get out the Google doc. Um, but there's a, well, I think you're already answering my question. My, yeah. my, my ultimate question was going to be, why isn't the database just handling this? But it sounds like you have the workers doing too much stuff. Yeah. To a procedure in the database. Exactly. Be because there's so much, you basically for the facade worker, you have to parse through get, um, get logs. And for the GitHub API worker, you have to actually send APIs calls to GitHub and then get the data back from okay. GitHub. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. So it's pretty exciting because we we went two weeks without getting much done. And this week we've just like crammed through such an amazing amount of stuff. I'm, I'm just so happy with how this week's gone. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. So then with respect to the value metric stuff, this mm -hmm. is a ton, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. This is going to help a ton. And so the next things that need to happen, and Parth is going to hear more about this from me on Monday, but um, the next things that are going to happen are we have a table, I'm looking for it right now, called auger labor or repo labor. So this is where the next worker we're going to create is going to be the one that goes and does the line counting and labor estimations for a project. So that's going to be a worker. And then the other thing that has to happen is we're going to write the APIs Re reconfigure some of the APIs we currently have talking to the facade database to communicate directly with Postgres. And my rough, rough estimate is we, we may get that finished next week or it may be two weeks from now. Um, Maybe I wanna be pretty clear on like how the workers work together. So if you're yes. building <laughs> different workers, cause like if I think of like bots, yep. they're usually process oriented and they just handle like one process and they seem lots of times they're kind of independent from one another. But they are. Like it's going to be kind of different in that regard. No, like, they're, the architecture is designed uh, to be independent. But uh, like if I want to do the repo labor worker, I probably have to run the, some sort of data collection worker. Yep. To get the data that I need. That's all that, one is contingent on the other. Yeah, that's true. Um, let me bring up something else here that I think will, so the worker architecture, and there's a whole document that I'm gonna publish shortly, but mm -hmm. I've been waiting for us to have a, a working version of it before publishing it, because until now, it's just been an idea that we've been developing over the course of this last, let's say two to three months. And let's see, share. Can you, is there, I don't, it may be totally overkill. So this is the, basically the architectural vi diagram for how this architecture works. So the things that are in this orange color are the, are the auger workers slash helpers. Uh -huh. The blue ones are auger main processes and the green ones are unicorn workers, which are things that run inside of the web part. So this, these server processes, um, go they basically tell the broker um what things need to be collected and then the broker puts I things see. in a worker queue and the the workers then pick things up off of the worker queue so the workers are looking at the queue the brokers are filling the queue and then the workers are updating the database directly and telling the broker when they're done so okay so you have a broker <laughs> kind of orchestrating all this stuff exactly okay exactly. and so the the, the specs that we've written the code to have a pretty clear um, example. And there's an example in the, in the broker, there's a broker branch on the auger repository. And in that broker branch, you can see the implemented version of the broker worker architecture. The broker is not quite finished. Okay. Um, then the housekeeper is another thing that is going to have to be finished, but those are both things that Gabe is focused like a laser on. I see. But at the beginning of this week, we had no workers and no brokers, and now we have a almost functioning broker and three functioning workers. What does the housekeeper do? The housekeeper is like, it, it takes a look at what's in the 
what what the scheduled or desired frequency of updating different kinds of data are for a repository and says now is the time to go get more issue data or issue comments or whatever from Augur's repository or, or, or the chaos repository or any. It's really just a, it's a scheduler or a time maintainer or something like that. It's yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the piece of the architecture that says, okay, it's time to kick this off for a set of repositories. Okay. Okay. So it's, yeah. It's a little, it's a little, I think easier to understand than, than what we've been doing. Uh, the documents I think make it more transparent. Okay. So really with the housekeeper, all I would do is just set time. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. And it's a, it is actually a process that goes out and kicks things off, but okay. it's going to be the thing that looks at how frequently I want things updated. Like yeah. my rough cut of how often we'd want the badging data updated was like okay. once a month. Okay. You know, like I don't think any more frequently than that is useful. Um, and it does this, the database oh. is designed to persist all collections of um, license data, or I'm sorry, um, badge data. So, for example, we could show the progress of projects in badging. Over so, does time. the housekeeper actually time the <clears throat> workers in D, or does it time the broker? It tells the broker. It actually communicates with the broker and tells the broker to kick stuff off. And the broker puts it on a queue, and the workers pick it up. I see. Okay. <coughs> cool. I like this kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with what we have here right now. Um, okay, you know there's work there's work to be done, and I think the biggest work is making it all come together and releasing a version of Augur that has it all working. But you know the fact that we got through getting it up in a week uh, feels is promising. I think. Cool. Sean, could you show the um, schema one more time? Sure. And could could you just do you mind doing a quick scan of that that big sure uh, table, um, right to, just to sure from so the big table is like that is the badge table mm -hmm. and all we're doing is dropping the 258 fields that are part of badging into columns so we're we call the api and we just save a snapshot of what's in a particular project okay um repo info is mostly github repository kinds of data but there are other things in there and so number of pull our pull requests enabled are what are the number of open issues our pages enabled how many forks are there what's the default branch um, what's the watchers count what are the stars count um, committers how many of them are there so the intention for this table is to store metadata about a repository at points in time mm -hmm. that the user elects how frequently we collect that data. A repository is a repository. The repository labor table is a, just that's a count of the programming language, the files, the total lines of code, the language of the lines, uh, code complexity, the repository URL. Um, and do I have complexity in there? Yeah, it does code, I have code complexity, a number for that. That table may expand as we decide what we wanna persist. I mean, I'm thinking of labor as a parameter, parameterized function that will display on the front end. So you, so you can put in values for what labor is going to cost. So um, the way I'm seeing this um, is that, like hanging off of this repo table, mm -hmm. is repo labor, which is a value mm -hmm. work group related issue, and the CII stuff is a risk risk related yeah so if we have new components they will probably i'm guessing <laughs> generally hang off of this repo table i think so yeah I c there could be some things that hang off of um repository groups for example okay. um list serves i think are generally generally list serves cover more than one repository generally they're covering a collection of repositories mm -hmm. although you could have a like apache all of their projects are in one like Apache projects tend to be in like one organization. Like there's one org and one repo. Um, I think libraries will serve as a risk uh, metric mm -hmm. because of the dependencies of the different repos or projects. 
so that's that's our refactoring of the libraries.io database basically that's those three tables those right three there. tables here yeah this okay. this is all like we looked at libraries.io and we cool. basically added the things and added some consistent naming okay. to it so it'll be easy, easier to retrieve data from haven't started on that worker yet but i imagine what our intention there is frankly is to take a fork of the of the um, libraries.io code and implement it in Augur, but not keep it connected to libraries.io because it's really hard to tell what they're doing. Okay. Um, oh, like for the future? For the future, yeah. Like I don't want to have that dependency baked in. I think mm -hmm. that you know a version of what they have as a worker is all that we need. Mm -hmm. um, so, Sean, um, key thing that I that kind of jumps out at me is each one of these tables has got a data collection date field. Yep. And so just to be clear, the, the intention is, is that e each one of these tables rep is going to work as a time series. So you can go and do, you know, go and look at the, the his you can get the most recent snapshot, of course, but you can look at the whole history and, and you can generate analysis over time. Yes, exactly. The, the time series analysis is certainly part of that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is important is that we know what tool collected it, what version of the tool, what is the source of the data, and what is the date that we collected it into Augur. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the case of repos, we also store, in addition to the date that we did the collection, we store the date that something was committed and the, the committer date, and also the date something was authored and the author date, right. which follows Facade's architecture 100%. Yeah. So I have um, a request slash proposal or something for you to consider. Okay. One is um, to add a JSON field to each one of these tables so that it would be extensible in the field without having to update the schema. Um, the other is I think it would be nice to add um, two tables. Uh, to the system. One is a table just, just called events. Okay. And events uh, would have maybe, maybe three columns. One column would be an event type, which would be user definable. Another column would be a timestamp that the event happened. And the last column would be a JSON column where people can, you know, fill in a a JSON record that you know corresponds with whatever type of a record it is, uh, and you know the the way that that might be useful. There there might be things that that people would um, like to analyze that aren't anticipated in the schema. Mm -hmm. and if you just have a generic events table where mm -hmm. people can can post an event with their own data upload tools, whatever they come up with, I think that would be useful. And um, another proposal would be to have um, a table called metrics, which, which has the same structure. Uh, a type field, uh, a timestamp field, and then a JSON field. Uh, for people to do any types of, any types of analysis that they would want to do, would allow people to experiment and to try a different thing um, we can't invent. Something. That's my uh, well, those feedback are or those are things ideas. that are you know I don't think we have a issue event because GitHub gives us events for issues yes. like open and closed and so we could um, generalize that and and have it be um, uh, this a general events field up to or events table and if that if that looks implausible or too many layers of abstraction, then we could create the events table that you speak of. Do you imagine that it, these events and metrics tables would be connected in any kind of relationship with existing tables, or are you just looking for sort of a free form way of collecting data? I, so I would just connect it to the repo table. Okay, all right. And um, some of the things that I'm talking about, you know, are covered in these, in these tables that you have, you know, you've yeah. got for example, you've got um, this labor table, which is metrics on labor. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, so my proposal would, would cover uh, 
instances of metrics that we would like to collect that we can't anticipate right now. It's, it's a kind of a future proofing. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem adding these things to the schema. That's, that's easy. I think one thing that I can say is when we, hear, when we learn about things that people want, we're probably going to try to figure out what the right relational structure is because I think one of the strengths of Augur for prototyping and playing around is that we've defined pretty clearly now what data is where and what relationships exist. Right. And I, I, there's already tools out there that kind of, you know, one of my, one of the reasons we haven't employed JSON fields is like, I could have just put it all this data for the Linux foundation in one big JSON field. Right. Um, there's two reasons I didn't. One is performance. If I'm looking at a large number of repos, the other, and for me, a more significant concern is that that le that tends to lend itself to people or to, building things that just kind of go get the data and dump it and solve the problem of um, figuring out how to make sense of it and analyze it later. Yes. And, and I think that essentially postpones labor. It postpones the work um, right. for somebody trying to get some metrics out of a, out of this in, out of what auger, because you know, eventually you're going to have to figure out what that JSON means. And then you also, right won't be aware of, for example, if we'd have just dropped what we get from the Linux Foundation into a JSON field, we right. probably wouldn't have noticed that they added two columns to their schema um, over the course of the last two weeks. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and now the way we have it set up is we'll get, we'll get a message if the, the, the schema changes from a JSON perspective and be able to incorporate that new information into a schema in a way that's, you know, we can figure out what it all means. Yeah. So these, these schemas are great and, you know, it gives guidance and it, it gives focus to the, to the community. So uh, I think it's awesome how you've laid it out. And, and I agree with um, your idea to, you know, expand the schema as new things uh, come in. Uh, so the, the utility of the things that I just proposed would be more for experimenters, you know, for people who want to, yeah. Test new ideas and and maybe maybe try out things that don't fit in the exact in in this in this uh, system. Well, and that's that's exactly why I'm going to just add that stuff and um, add some documentation to what it's for um, using your your experimentation rationale. And I can I can back that up. I use the bookmark. Um, system that Andy had put together and for the experiment that we ran last semester we stored a ton of data that we need only for this experiment in the JSON fields right and that was very helpful yeah so that's yeah I'll do that there's that's that's you know change adding things to the schema is relatively easy compared to changing it so we put some time into developing the schema looking at what Others have done, and um, for the most part, I think we've we've got a more consistent naming, naming convention for columns and things like that. It's not perfectly fixed up yet, but it's certainly much more consistent than having three or four different schemas. Hey, Sean, can you post this somewhere? I will. I've been waiting for it to mature enough, um, and I think it's. I think we're at that point. Can you just so? It right now like put it in a drive somewhere and then sure. I can put it in the notes sure yep I will do that okay and I'll I'll even specify that it's like a, a living document for some evolving yeah I'm going to do that right now as soon as I okay. Okay. All right. So Augur has dominated the conversation, which is fine with me. One last one last question about Augur. Um, yeah. Any progress on getting a uh, an instance of Augur for? Yeah. So yes, there is. Um, I will get. I, I have. I have downloaded all the repos, and <laughs> what I was, I've downloaded the repos, and I've actually I'm running facade over them right now. There are something like three thousand repos altogether. Um, there were 1,700 in Apache alone, so that's taking place right now. My, I got sidetracked this week working on getting all the Postgres stuff working with my team. So, um, 
what I'll probably do right now is give us a, an instance on the old MySQL um, structure and not, not make us wait, but I did, I have the data and I will share an instance of Augur um, when it's done analyzing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it would be useful to uh, do some cross training, uh, how to administer Augur, how to set up Augur, or, or at the least, um, if we if we could get a, a link to the latest setup notes, um, yeah, maybe we could multitask on that. Um, maybe one of the interns could could help out. Maybe one of us could help out. Yeah, I'm I'm. I'll be happy to try and set up the auger on my system. Okay, I would say just like uh, wait a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, give us uh, you know give us a little bit of time. Uh, maybe like give us the, give us to next week to have all that ready. So by this call next week, I'll have the the updated. Before June first, I'll have an updated README. So I, I don't. When is our call? Is it the thirty first next week? I guess. So yeah, I have to have an updated README ready to go for something else by then. So that will get done. And when it comes to documentation, I'm surely happy to spread the load. Do you have any suggestions on the right way or the best way to do that, Andy? Well, um, one way would be we just distribute a, a installation instructions on README and we tell people go for it. Like and read the docs.io, that is that what you mean? Oh, um, well, I think uh, just markdown docs, you know, yeah. GitHub is awesome. That's what we have. And, yeah. and uh, those still work. So everything in the master branch is still valid. We've been working in other branches. Um, okay. uh, but so to get this, I have to get it to the point that it's ready to release. And I, like I said, it's, it's not impossible that it could happen next week. I think it's more likely that um, it'll happen later, like the week after. Mm -hmm. You know, another approach we could take is we could just ask for volunteers to go through and do an install of the current system and then give PRs where they find efficiencies in the documentation. That, that might be a way of you know, maybe Vinod and I could do that next week. If yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Like, we do practical because I'll be doing it on a fresh system or a fresh uh, virtual environment, and I'll face a couple of issues, and I can create a pull request on that. Okay. Um, that sounds like a plan. I guess the, my question, Vinod, is do you want to do that on the way that it is right now, or do you want to do that on the, the implementation of the new schema? My Very recommendation... My recommendation would be that be comfortable. I can just create a like total new environment and start doing it. Okay. My my take is to do it on the new schema, but yeah. that would just be me. Like, and that would be my yeah. Okay. So when the new scheme is up, I'll do it also. Okay, that's great. Uh, that's that's awesome. Um, that is such exciting help to get. Um, so now I'm even more motivated to get the new schema out there. Awesome. Okay, anything more in Augur? John, did you post the schema? Um, I'm, I'm okay, so I'm anal retentively tidying it up just a little bit with the latest updates from today. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm almost done. Fine, okay. Just put it in the minutes. I have a little thing in here. Okay. I, I, I bolded it, Sean. Just put it in there. So next next subject on the agenda, a proposal for Chaos Con for the Value Metrics Group. Um, we should submit a proposal. What should it contain? So in the past, what has worked really well for the working groups is to submit a workshop and invite participants to through develop pilot work with the metrics and improve them somehow. That is one idea. Do we are we going to have a that hacker space that we had at Vancouver? Uh, or can we get that because that. That worked out pretty well. We have two rooms. And we also have but, a... But not the... Uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, we also have a 80-minute session. But uh, not the... Uh... 
Okay. Remember at, at Vancouver, we had those two tables that were set up as a hacker space. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know that we're going to have that. We have two rooms right now. So one is going to be like for presentations, kind of the normal kind of thing. And then the other room will be available for kind of longer sessions or just for breakout for folks. But we don't necessarily have a hacker table. So last year, what Kevin was referring to, outside of ChaosCon, at this during the summit, we had oh, uh, that. hacker space, the tables that were specifically for us. I remember that. I don't know how we got those, but <laughs> we uh, asked the right people. <laughs> yeah, like on the right day. Uh, Kevin, I don't know the answer to that, but I can, I can see okay. what's up. With this. I, this is I think a lot of a lot of work got done at those, uh, especially for DNI. Okay. Well, I'll check that out. Um, but Andy, yeah. I, I think for the Chaos Con, not necessarily for Open Source Summit North America, but for Chaos Con, I think it would make a ton of sense for you to submit a proposal that is really about what the value metrics working group is doing, kind of what their trajectory is. I think it would be great um, to get you up in front of everybody. Like you, you, <laughs> not, not you, all of us. Um, but just talk about kind of what the tra trajectory has been so far. Um, so really just kind of a, you know, an overview of the, of the value working group would be tremendously useful. How long are the chaos con sessions? Gary would know the answer to that. And I'm going to look that up right now. So we have three different session types. One is a lightning talk, which is about five minutes. We have a regular talk or session, which is about 20 minutes, and then hence on workshop, which is one hour. Okay, so this week I'll uh, actually in the next, in the coming days I'll put together a proposal. I'll share it with with all of you, and um, we'll see if it gets accepted or not. Great. I I know people who are doing the uh, the analysis of what gets submitted, so I'll put in a good word for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, next on our agenda. Uh, Vinod is working on a value survey. We spent last week um, talking about that. Uh, Vinod, you want to tell us a little, little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, I've shared a link to the... You're muted, Vinod. I've shared a link to the survey. So in last meeting, we discussed, like I've developed a questionnaire around some uh, aspects of how the open source organi uh, organization are generating value through their involvement in uh, open source. So that was discussed between Georg, Andy, and uh, myself. Uh, I haven't done much on that, like on the feedback, because I was in the conference, so I couldn't get time to finish it. But that question is there. I have to fine tune it and add uh, more to it. So if you all can take a peek and share your suggestions or thoughts, most welcome. I'll take a look at this. I'm not going to look at it all right now. Yep. But, yeah, it's yeah. it's basically around three propositions. Like, okay, how uh, businesses are, uh, uh, like, what businesses are offering through open source, and how they are delivering that value, and how they are capturing that value by their involvement in open source. These okay. are the three major aspects. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'll happily take a look at it, but it'll take a little bit of time. Okay. Vinod, are you going to be in San Diego um, for ChaosCon? I have to talk to Matt on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 I think we'll probably sit down in short order and figure out who's going. 
Okay, sure. awesome. Um, Vinod, what is, what is some next steps for your survey? And um, when do you think you're going to have results that um, you can share? So my next step is along this uh, like fine tuning this questionnaire. I'm also I have started collecting the data that whom I'm going to approach for this survey, like companies and the contact person. So I'm like right now scrapping the web and collecting the contact for the different people. So my my goal will be like in maybe in two weeks time I should have all the contacts so that uh, in the meantime and question will be ready so that I can uh, start sending the surveys. So maybe by fifteenth of June, I'm keeping that target. And and the the survey, uh, it will be an email contact that you make. Yeah. So I'll send an email to the. Uh, volunteers and then uh, the survey will be in the qualitrix like uh, a web link will be there so they have to fill the survey over there how many people are, are you expecting to reach out to uh, not sure right now I'm just collecting the data so maybe uh, I'm at least targeting to 500 to 700 emails to send at least that's awesome that's, I don't know the response rate right now, but let's see. That that's that's awesome. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, no, that's all from my side. And I did add a footnote to the minutes with the link to the PDF of the schema. Cool. I think um, at least I didn't have access to it. Maybe you can activate link share. Oh really? I. Okay, I believe you. And we know if I got it. you want to pilot yeah. oh, the I see. questionnaire, yeah. uh, you can always reach like out. Okay. All right, that should anybody with the link, Matt, you already had access to the folder. Why don't you oh. give it a try, Georg, and make sure that it's working? That hang on, I'll just. Yep, it works now. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay, um, just quick uh, talk about grants. Um, the, the only one that I'm aware of in the near term is a grant proposal that I am going to send to Mozilla uh, next week. Um, I'm going to ask for some, some funds to cover travel costs for conferences. So maybe if they give a thumbs up, uh, maybe Mozilla can send uh, some of us to San Diego. And beyond that, uh, I've got nothing else on my radar screen. So I, you know, I just in terms of travel, I we've had success in the past. You can request travel support from the Linux Foundation itself. I don't know if you know this. Oh. Okay. So, we'll so put Georg's been funded, I think, maybe three times. Is that right? Yeah, three or four times. I just shared the link in the chat where you can submit your travel fund request. Okay. Uh, will do. Thank you very much for that. Uh, last thing I have on the list, um, in preparation for Chaos Con and our Linux Foundation uh, talk, uh, I am starting to do some interviews with um, open source program offices. Uh, so I'm just starting to do outreach right now. I've got um, GitLab, I've got Mozilla, I've got um, uh, three or four other companies, you know, here in um, here in the Bay Area. So I hope to have some feedback uh, from, let's say, half a dozen folks. Uh, and also, you know, kind of there's there's two goals that I have. One is to get some feedback in terms of um, their main interests, you know, are they concerned about recruiting costs? Are they concerned about um, labor costs, etc.? cetera? Uh, I want to introduce them to Augur um, and see if this is something that would be of interest. And the last thing is just to, just to try and build community to, to you know, reach out and, and figure out who out there in industry is interested in value metrics. So that is 
that's starting. And if, if anyone um, knows of folks within industry that, you know, in open source program offices um, that would like to be part of the survey, please forward that contact to me. When it, you want to do this before Open Source Summit North America? Yep. I want to start doing it over the next couple of weeks, and, okay. and probably the campaign will go on over the course of a month or so. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, then I have one last thing for this group, which is I'm going to put it in the chat. And this, I put two links in there. This is just a reminder that if you, as a working group, are planning on releasing any metrics as part of the version one release from chaos in about three weeks, we need your candidate metrics for release. So the first link is the spreadsheet that would identify what those candidate metrics are. And the second link is the criteria for what would constitute a released metric. Sounds good. So I'll just let you kind of take soak that in and it's not it's not a, it's not an, an imperative that every working group has metrics that are part of the first release because obviously like D and I will have them because they've been around for much longer value started considerably more recently and risked it as well so I would suspect evolution will have some so anyway that's that but it's it's coming soon sooner than later at this point Awesome. That is exciting. Yes. All right, cool. That's it for me on that one. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. All right, talk to you next week. See ya. All right, see ya. Bye.